Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back. Glad to see you here. Let me ask a, uh, a quick question of everyone here in the audience. This is just, uh, just kind of satisfying my curiosity. How, do, how many of you, just raise your hands, how many, oh, wait a minute. Hang on. Hello? <laughs> yes? Oh, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, I will. I will. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I've just been asked to tell you to turn off your cell phone, so very important message. Uh, anyway, my question, so kind of a show of hands, how many of you have played World of Warcraft? Don't be shy. Okay, keep, uh, keep them up, keep them up. Uh, how many of you have raided in World of Warcraft? Losing a few hands. How many of you have been raid leaders in World of Warcraft? A fair number. Okay. So I have a confession. I, I also play World of Warcraft. And uh, one of the servers I play on, I'm a member of a very casual guild. Uh, members of this guild, they're from all walks of life. Um, unlike a lot of guilds, I would say we probably have a very broad range of ages. There are people like 15 years old and people 60 years old. We have uh, students, we have doctors, we have therapists, we have writers, teachers, musicians. Um, about half of the guild members are women, and the other half are men. Um, may seem a little unusual, but it's a very sort of microcosm of society, it seems like to me. Anyway, it's very casual. These are not hardcore players. Um, about a year ago, I decided to encourage uh, this particular guild to start raiding. And uh, I had some experience on another server raiding, so I sort of became the de facto raid leader, which is different than the guild leader, as many of you know. Um, most of these people had never raided before. Um, now my background is, is managing software development teams, so I, I have some management experience and um, I'm not a stranger to leadership roles, but what I discovered was leading a raid was a lot more challenging than I'd expected. In fact, I'd say it's probably one of the most challenging leadership roles I'd ever encountered. Now, everyone in the raid is, they're not paid to be there, they're all volunteers, and they're all there for different reasons. Some people want to, you know, just play with others. Some people are there for gear, some want to experience content. Um, everyone's reasons are different, and managing this group requires a lot of different skills. So there's recruitment and time management. I have to figure out when we're going to raid and make sure we can pick a time that we get the, the right people to be there. Um, there's also strategy. I need to figure out which raid we're doing. I need to figure out um, we want to, I want to choose something that's going to be challenging to people without being um, too difficult where people are just going to, you know, get demoralized. Can't be too easy either because then they don't get any valuable rewards from it. There's also research as a raid leader. I need to read up on all the bosses and know how the fights are going to progress and understand the boss abilities. There's tactics during the actual raid. I have to adjust the fight on the fly and adapt to changing dynamics, you know, call things out. There's logistics, I have to make sure people have the right gear, they have all the right consumables. And then there's human resources, you know, I have to make sure this person is playing the class they want to play and they're not mad that this other person's playing that. There's morale, you know, every time we wipe, people are going to get demoralized, so I have to be there. I know you can do it, we can do this, you know, I have to be the cheerleader as well. And there's discipline, you know, sometimes people are not doing things that are in the best you know, goals of the team, so I have to tell people stop doing that and you need to do this and redirect people. Sometimes I actually have to fire people from the raid. Now, one of the things in common with all these things is these are all skills required for business leadership. And so I started to think about my time as a raid leader as sort of my, my management training night. Now, I'm not the first person to think of this this way. A few years ago, IBM commissioned a company called Seriosity to study leadership in online games as part of their uh, global Innovation Outlook. The report from that study, Virtual Worlds, Real Leaders, had a number of surprising conclusions. For one, real leadership skills were identified in people you might not expect. More significantly, various aspects of the game environments were actually encouraging leadership growth and could be an indicator of how leadership might evolve in the future. Dr. Byron Reeves and Dr. Jay Layton Reed were behind that study, and it turns out they've been thinking about how online games can change the way people do business for quite a while. What if you could translate or transfer key ingredients of game design to the business environment? They say that's not just possible, but inevitable. They believe that game ideas will transform the way we work and the way we think about work, 
and they've recently released a book, which is Total Engagement, which I have here, um, published by Harvard Business Press, and this really redefines leadership for the 21st century. Dr. Byron Reeves is a professor at Stanford University and has authored over 100 published studies of responses to immersion, immersive features of media, including games. Dr. Jay Layton Reed is a physician, inventor, successful biotechnology founder, CEO, and venture capitalist. Won't you join me in welcoming them both? Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Peter. All right. Sound check, test, test. I'd like you to meet Ted. Ted graduated from a great university, he has a fancy MBA, and he doesn't exactly hate his job, but there's things about his job that aren't ideal. A lot of his work is kind of boring, and, and some of it is subject to very ambiguous goals and priorities. And even when he's at the top of his game, even when he's at the top of his game, he's getting conflicting feedback, and he's subject to information overload, and maybe most important of all, he's wishing that somehow this job he worked so hard to get, had more of a defining purpose. This is work Ted. This is game Ted. Game Ted's hair's on fire. He is totally engaged in a sophisticated uh, play. Uh, he's getting constant feedback. He's playing a role in a complex story. He knows what to do. He can be extemporaneous, but he's got, got some uh, boundaries on that. He collaborates with teammates all over the world. Uh, he knows what he gets when he wins. These may be things all counterpoints to uh, uh, work Ted. And he knows that he doesn't win unless, unless his team wins. The play is really fast. Risk is not only tolerated, but it's rewarded. Everything's transparent, numbers flying all over the place, levels, expertise available for all to see, tons of analytics. Fair competition, knows the rules, a meritocracy. These are the tools that WorkTed uses all day long. Some people call it enterprise software, email, um, project management, reporting. Oh, and if he's really lucky, he gets to look at a video conference every now and then. And these are the tools that uh, GameTed gets to use. Uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, highly immersive, some of the most in, uh, sophisticated collaborative uh, tools possible. Uh, Self-representation on the screen, not just interactive, but I get to jump in the screen. Uh, immersive pictures may not be uh, needed, but uh, uh, they're there nonetheless, and this is just uh, uh, great narratives and a place to jump in. We're going to talk about a convergence between the worlds, the two different worlds that Ted lives in. And as Peter said in his introduction, we don't just think it's possible, we think it's inevitable. Byron's going to be on a panel with a bunch of futurists in a day or two talking about what the world of 2020 is going to look like, and you're going to get a preview of that. Work is interesting today. Some jobs are too easy to do well. They're repetitive and boring. And the, the job you're going to do a year from now is exactly as the same as the job today. There's no vector of accomplishment. Some jobs are too hard to do well because for the same reasons that we described with Ted, inconsistent feedback, ambiguous goals, a lack of a sense of purpose. We think games have a lot to offer for both kinds of hard jobs. And we're going to give you seven reasons why we think this is not just likely, but it's inevitable. We're going to illustrate these reasons with some stories. And the stories kind of, kind of go with each reason. You can move the stories around. Don't get too hung up on that. Each of them sort of um, help, helps us make a separate set of points. And eventually, we're going to be interested in hearing your stories. In the meantime, uh, let's get down to business. The background for this, as you've already heard, is uh, a series of uh, collaborations or a continuous collaboration that Byron and I have uh, been involved in for the last uh, five or so years, right? And um, we started talking about these ideas and comparing notes of, from things in our own background. And one of the major milestones in this work was the report that Peter described to you that we did for IBM. That work continued to be refined, and Byron wrote a paper for Harvard Business Review along with Tom Malone at the Sloan School at MIT and with Tony O'Driscoll, who was then at IBM, who's now at Duke's Fuquay School. 
And it, it was a big deal for HBR to take on this game idea. There were plenty of people on the editorial board who were a little uneasy about it, especially when they saw the art that came along with this story. This, uh, uh, that piece of art was definitely a risk uh, for uh, Management Science Journal, but uh, we, we loved it and, and use it. So we've got these seven reasons, uh, and if you're taking notes, uh, we've actually got numbers on the top of the slides with some examples. Reason number one, this is the reason that when we visit the Fortune 100 companies, and we've probably in the last five years been to most of them to talk about games, this is where we really spend a lot of time. We're going to just go in and out of this in a couple seconds. Games are big. There are big people playing them. Uh, not just adolescent boys in dark basements, but uh, middle-aged folks with mortgages and uh, yard work and uh, pretty common stuff. A lot of dollars being spent on this and a whole ton of time. A lot of time actually being taken from other media, especially television. This is news to most folks in companies who are not aware that, uh, that there's an entertainment revolution and it's not uh, radio, television, newspapers anymore. Uh, and it's not just film and television for, uh, uh, for uh, in-home entertainment. So this is obviously the choir here, uh, and we're hardly preaching, but uh, I think you'll stipulate that this is a, a pretty big deal. It's starting to get to be a fairly big deal in business. We're still at the very early edges of this. You're looking at a screen for a game that was played by 19,000 people several months ago for a week these people all sold stuff for Cisco and instead of spending 100 million dollars to all meet in Las Vegas they spent 10 million dollars putting together a virtual space same space where the CEO could talk and people could meet and they could play games there are leaderboards there's stuff to do things to find there's a lot of augmented reality things that are happening actually at the conference uh, there was a live counterpart to this, a small one, but things that you were doing and chatting and online. These things are happening for a lot of folks. Now they said, I didn't quite like it as much as I liked going to Las Vegas with everyone, one, but $100 million went down to $10 million and it'll get done again. So these are big people, fairly big numbers. Uh, they might actually pay for this in a little bit different way than uh, uh, that we've been hearing about at the conference. Reason number two, there's a new kid on the block, the millennials, people who grew up with the media being created by folks in this room. And of course, that includes many of you. Competition is fun and familiar. Failure doesn't hurt. Risk is part of the game. You know, this is a generation that thinks that work is a thing you do, not a place you go. This is a generation of workers who don't want to be measured by an odometer. They want to be measured by a speedometer. I mean, these are multitasking team players with very different sensibilities. And when they come to work and see that stuff that Work Ted has on his desk, they're going to say, this game sucks. <laughs> All right? And if, if, if the big boss says, well, grow up, kid, welcome to our world, he's not going to be able to compete with the bosses that embrace these sensibilities and reinvent their workplaces to take advantage of all the incredible skills that come with these sensibilities and this experience. So this is a pretty natural meeting for uh, if, you, if you're in virtual worlds or playing Warcraft or whatever immersive game you're in, uh, this is a pretty cool thing. It's not necessarily a place at IBM, it's either folks that actually work at IBM doing actual work. Uh, it's not a place you'll see executives showing up for a board meeting with antlers sticking, sticking out of their head. But it's a place that's very comfortable for a lot of the folks that are uh, uh, with that experience. And it's a place they can actually have some fun, add some spice into, in, in, in an important way, important ways to, for creativity, innovation, add some spice into what they're doing. And Peter was uh, uh, kind enough to talk about the Seriosity study. This is the cover uh, for that uh, Seriosity IBM study where we were actually looking at what leaders were doing at IBM, not just uh, making inferences about uh, how they might think of uh, uh, games and, and the real world. We actually surveyed them, and Tony helped us do this. We actually went in and said, first of all, we had to ask ourselves, can we find a couple hundred middle managers at IBM who, who could raise their hand to the same question Peter asked you? I uh, have been on raids, I lead guilds, in uh, titles like Warcraft. 
pretty easy to find as long as there was a disclaimer that the boss didn't have to know exactly uh, how many hours it took to get to uh, uh, you know, level 60, 70, uh, 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 and the answer to that, is, uh, we know from our colleague Nikki, is somewhere around 500. Uh, but we asked them questions, once we found them, about what they thought of that game experience. And there, a lot of this reported in the Harvard Business Review piece, but half of them are saying that games actually improve their leadership in the real world. And vice versa. They could actually think of things, and they were actively doing it. It's not like our questions were the only thing that initiated that. They were actively thinking about how these worlds related. And a whole lot of them, a clear majority of them, were willing to say that the environmental influences, this is the lead find from our study reported in HBR, that when you ask gamers about leadership, they say, leader, well, their, their, their real world expectation is that leaders are people that are found and nurtured and tested and mentored. Uh, they were born that way. When you talk to gamers, they often say, Leadership is a property of the environment in which the leading and following gets done. In anybody, some of them would say anybody, but a lot of people can do the leading. You lead this hour, I'll lead next hour, you have expertise in this, so turnover is very quick. So it's a very different uh, kind of feel, but uh, the people that are actually doing the work are saying, there's stuff in there that we can use to actually improve our environment. Reason number three, play is not the opposite of work. Play is not a four-letter word. Some of you may know the story about Mayor Bloomberg of, of New York. Bloomberg was uh, touring some um, administrative facility in the city of New York, and he came across a guy who was playing solitaire on his computer, and the mayor fired him right there on the spot. He said, this is not an appropriate use of, of city resources or city time. Turns out, later someone published a study that showed that if you take a break and play something like solitaire, you're actually refreshed. That's not our main point today, but Bloomberg's notion uh, what really represents kind of an outdated view of the, of, uh, the, the Protestant or Puritan ethic. Um, he um, misunderstood the fact that for the last hundred years, beginning with uh, Homo Ludens and many other writers, there's sort of a whole rethinking about how hopelessly intertwined human performance and play actually are. Um, some of you know the, the concept of flow, popularized by Mihai Chixing Mihai. And flow is a state that happens where, where you're involved in a very difficult task in which you have exactly the right skills for it. So surgeons and mountain climbers and all kinds of people, time disappears. You lose your sense of identity. You are entirely in the moment in a task that is very difficult for which you have the, the right uh, skills. Now, what is wrong with that for the world of work? And of course, you realize that's exactly the kind of uh, experience that's going on when people are at their very best in your games. Let me give you an example about how people are starting to redesign work, thank you, uh, redesign work to make work more fun without even references to games. Some of you know about the Agile model of, of getting software written. And if you think about Agile, and if you don't know about it, you should, if you think about Agile, it operates at a faster pace. It, people have more autonomy about what they're working on. It's more social, and there's more interaction. There's more accountability. There's more flexibility. You get feedback quicker. Imagine if you took those and you dropped them into a game-like setting. Uh, this is from a presentation that was made uh, less than a year ago by somebody who works in a very large Midwestern insurance company, and their Agile teams now are, are having their, their meetings inside Teleplace, one of our favorite uh, virtual worlds for business. Uh, my company, Alloy Ventures, is an investor in Teleplace, so I should tell you that, but it's, it's cool. Check it out. Okay, reason number four, uh, and this is, uh, uh, relates to my day job. Uh, there's a science about, what, about the intuitions, actually, that are represented at this conference. There's, in the last 10 years, just a, a number of journals uh, that have, uh, are specifically devoted to social science, psychology, uh, empirical, quantitative experimentation done about games and about what in games actually work. Uh, here's, here's one of them. Uh, it's probably the, uh, one of the least likely in, uh, in terms of your own reviews. This is uh, your brain playing one of the most simple games imaginable. The only thing you have to remember when I tell you about actually how the game was played is that it's being played while you're in a magnet you're lying down, shoved into a hollow donut tube. Uh, loud banging is happening if you've ever had a, an MRI for, uh, uh, for any, any health reason. 
but we're looking at blood flow in the brain trying to figure out what's happening while on the screen you're actually playing a game. Here's the game. It's the uh, yellow uh, square there with the two green dots, or whatever color dots those are. You're the dot in the center. You've got a joystick while you're in the magnet, and your task is to follow the other dot in the upper right-hand corner as well as you can. It's going to move around, and you just follow it, navigating uh, X, Y around the, the uh, yellow background. But you do that under two different conditions. Half the playing in the magnet, you're told that that other green dot or other dot is being controlled by a computer, and it's this computer right here. You do have five little games. Then another five games, you're told that that dot is now being controlled by this person, and this person actually comes out the door and waves at you. In fact, it's controlled by a computer in both cases, but this is a frame, a belief that people are quite willing to take so it's a different experience. I think I'm following uh, John's dot or Frank's dot or whoever the experimenter is. The difference is really substantial and it really points to how these games can create a realism and a, and a frame of reference that is totally believable. When I think that dot is being controlled by another person, the regions in my brain that light up are involved with self-other connectedness and social relationships. When I'm following a dot that is controlled by a computer, visual cortex motion uh, tracking areas of the brain light up. So just the mere belief is a pretty good uh, determinant of the frame I have. And, and also, you know, we're interested now in how that uh, snowballs into substantial evaluations that I might make about the experience, how long I'm willing to stay with it, et cetera. So the dots get a face in our lab, so we start doing uh, instead of dots, we actually have uh, uh, characters that are, we call them avatars versus agents. Avatars controlled by other people, agents controlled by a computer. And we do the same thing with different kinds of primitive measures. So electrodes on your skin, we measure uh, the amount of electricity that can pass through your hand based on uh, the amount of moisture in your hand. We measure your heart rate, uh, acceleration, deceleration. You get a very similar difference. When I believe I'm doing Warcraft tasks, jointly building something, having a sword fight, uh, collaborating on uh, a strategy. When I believe I, the, the other character is controlled by another person, my heart, on average, is beating 10 beats per minute faster than when the computer is controlled, when I believe the computer is in control. So it's an, uh, more evidence that there's a frame involved here that's very powerful. Uh, I, we could, I could go on on this score for a long time. Here's another quick one. Narrative. One of the things that we hear in this conference or I've heard is a lot of people talking about story. Psychologists know a lot about how narrative influences processing. Uh, memory, uh, the amount of time you're willing to stay with tasks. When I shoot things in a first person shooter game, in the context of a story, there are two teams against each other, one's been winning the last week and I don't know if this one can win, I wonder what'll happen, uh, and you say a little bit about the narrative context, it's far more arousing, those are the blue bars, than if I think that, if, I, then I'm, if I'm just shooting stuff outside of the context of a story. So the intuitions, that, uh, the significant intuitions, hard-won intuitions that you have about how to build these games are, are really uh, uh, justified in the lab, so there's good data in the lab. This is the summary about all the work we've did. In the last 10 or 15 years, we've been on the trail of trying to figure out what's the difference between interactions in face-to-face, -face, in real life, objects, people, and interactions with things on the screen. And the, the summary, the most important summary, is the differences that we imagine are nowhere near as substantial as we think they might be, or assume that they might be. There's a lot of very primitive, interesting, influential psychology that happens uh, because our brains are old. There's no switch up there that says mediated, symbolic, uh, don't treat it as real, and uh, oh, this is real life, I need to bring into play all the different mechanisms that, that actually deal with reality. That's the most important finding. One of the things that or the places, uh, the example that I chose for, we chose for this portion of this, is a game that we're working on that is of the simplest variety, uh, very much uh, in tune with the social games that people are playing now, and it's in the context of behavior change. This is a game 
that uh, Seriosity is working on with Dante Anderson. So he gets some of the blame for the pictures here. Um, and it, and it is, it's, it's not rich, immersive, uh, three-dimensional, lots of polygon stuff that, that uh, titillate my brain in all the right ways. It's this frame that I bring in, into this game. It's a game about, it's also a game that actually takes input from the real world. In this case, it takes input from utility smart meters about the electricity that's being used in my house. And that's the little up and down jagged uh, uh, data there. It's taking that information and it's advantaging my play in a simple game based on what's happening in the real world. So uh, a lot of story here. I'm uh, chasing a family around a house. I'm turning lights on and off. I'm learning about how much energy uh, in that little tachometer in the lower left that the refrigerator is soaking up and the, uh, the microwave and uh, how much the hot water uh, cost to heat and I've got to chase these uh, this family members around let them do all the things they want to do in the house uh, uh, to, to keep them happy happiness bars on the bottom there so I'm really having a, a, a very real experience and and, th and and could be playing with other players eventually but I've taken this simple graphics in my mind turned it into something that's that's uh, that's real and I'm playing with other people I know that I, I know a lot of them. I know all of them in, in uh, my version of the game right here. Uh, I can see the stuff they've got on their house. Uh, Dante doesn't have a windmill. He's not doing as well as I am on the Friday Night Lights Out challenge. Uh, but it's all these social, interactive belief that 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 this is all uh, uh, consequential for changing behavior. All right. Reason number five why this is inevitable is that engagement is in short supply. Working on this thesis with Byron, I've read most of the great management books. I've got a library that you wouldn't believe of great management books, but my favorite management guru is Scott Adams, the, uh, the brilliant management advisor who has conceived of this, this very functional, wonderful world of Dilbert. And engagement, well, what is it? Um, there, in this, in this, this is one panel out of a strip where there, you know, there's going to be a big uh, engagement initiative inside uh, the company where Dilbert works. And people are saying, what, what, what is that all about? And the boss says, well, I don't know what it is, but it's something about you idiots working harder for the same pay. What a great concept. Well, there are people that actually study engagement. There's formal constructs about how to measure it and think about it. And um, you know, it's, it's, kind of a, a, it's kind of a concept we all have some sense of. But if, if you take sort of a common sense definition of that and you look at, at what's different about people who, who score high on engagement at work and people who don't, it turns out that engaged employees have much more sense of efficacy to be able to influence things. They believe that they can impact quality and customer satisfaction or cost. Um, and there's even some data that companies with higher engagement actually create more value in terms of um, uh, sales per uh, revenue per employee and things like that. So there's, there's some pretty interesting reasons to care about engagement. But engagement is not a thing you do. Engagement is a thing you get when you do other things right, things that are woven throughout all of the user interface that the player, I mean employee, experiences as part of your game as an employer. And there's some research that shows you know, that paying for performance and that economic incentives not only don't work for certain kinds of tasks and certain kinds of people, they may actually be counterproductive. There's a wonderful riff on this in Daniel Pink's book, and he's got a great TED talk about this, in which he, he argues, and we agree with him, that there are three ingredients that you need to supply to create engagement. And that is you need to give employees a sense of autonomy. Now, as I go through this list, I want you to think about things that you do in the games that actually might enable this or even promote it. Give people a sense of autonomy so they have choices. Give people the opportunity to experience that magical sense of mastery. Think how closely coupled that is to the notion of flow. And then finally, you've got to give people some sense of purpose. You know, waking up rushing off to the office in order to, to deliver increased shareholder value may not do it for most employees. So there are companies like Whole Foods where they, people understand that the point of going to work is to teach people uh, 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 the facts they need and to think about a different relationship to food in their lives. And W.L. Gore and a host of other companies are really trying hard to get this right. Well, we know that that engagement is important. So let me tell you about um, a, a woman named Jennifer who walked across the street to get a job in a call center. Thanks. 
Um, she walked across the street to get a job in a call center for a 50 cent raise, and she walked in with her beautifully typed up resume and gave it to the hiring manager who said, oh, Jim, thank you very much. Uh, we'll file that somewhere, but we don't really look at those. Just go over to the computer in the cubicle there and sit down and start playing. If you get to level four, we'll start paying you. If you get to level 10, you'll be talking to real customers instead of just robots and trainers. And if you get to level 20, you'll be running a call center that really has virtual people spread across four different time zones, many of them working at home. And uh, who knows, this game doesn't really level out because we keep, uh, you know, there's no winning condition. We just keep building new levels. Go for it. We're wishing you the best. So Jen's been at, that, that was a week ago. So now she comes in and she sits down at her computer and she, uh, it's a pirate game right now. By the way, these, these uh, notions are modeled after a wonderful little game called Puzzle Pirates from Three Rings down in San Francisco. I bet many of you know this game. And she sees which of her team members are available for work and she's checking on her personal status and her personal transparent reputation that she shares with other team members. Let me move ahead a little bit here. Um, she is uh, figuring out where she stands. She's figuring out where her team stands and who's available. And um, she's a little bit worried about Mike. Mike has been kind of lagging lately. And so she decides to kind of uh, give him a little bit of uh, helpful support. So she uses the tools in the game to check in on Mike and give him uh, some extra encouragement. You know, the uh, call center work is not inherently a team sport. And what's really interesting about this notion is that you can manufacture a team and create meaningful, truly meaningful team reward structures, even if the job didn't require it. The old notion that a soldier is more willing to die for his buddy in the foxhole than for his country, uh, that locality is really important. Um, Jen has a chance to pick her task for the day. You know, she's maybe a little bit of a min-maxer, so she's actually, well, how, how much is that worth if I succeed there, and you know, and is that a, you know, and so she's, she, whoever's doing the level design in this game better pay attention because Jen is one of those people that is, is, is trying to uh, debug it or reverse engineer it. Um, and so now we get to, she takes her first call. She's been at it for 40, you know, 10 minutes. It's 8.40 in the morning and she's getting ready to take her first call. Well, let me tell you something about call center workers. There are about 4 million of them in the United States, or around the world, uh, 6 million, about 2 million in the United States. And they are the most wired up hooked up employees you can imagine. They, they, on their desktop is stuff that's, that's hooked in to CRM and IVRs and CTI and all this other alphabet soup of things that are serving up information about the caller, the call, the business processes that are needed, what's expected of her. So it's already a pretty wired up job. It's just not always very fun. They may be running little spiffs and contests on the whiteboard at the front. But imagine if Jen's voice stress is being monitored, and we can do that pretty well. That's actually not that big a stretch. Um, Jen's voice stress is being monitored, and she's getting a dashboard that's showing that it's not a big deal to tell the difference between four-letter words and please. There are problems with speech rec. It's getting better and better, but speech rec is up to the task of telling whether a call starts out with, with nice words and ends with four-letter words or vice versa, and there's a big difference in the business outcome of a call. I mean, we've all been on, on the phone with customer service reps, and you can, you can sort of get a sense of what's going on in their world. And it's not very gamey. Um, we can um, easily imagine Jen getting feedback based on all the important business processes in the call, as well as some things that may simply be there because they're fun. So why shouldn't she be getting feedback in every time scale uh, in terms of visuals and sound and animation and things that show team progress and individual progress and all of that? Even really mundane tasks uh, this is another example of turning things into a team sport. You know how they always ask to double check your phone number or your address or social security or you know, first grade teacher or whatever. Um, if, 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 you find, if Jen finds out that the answer is correct, the person who got it the first time obviously did something right. Boom, some points. Harder challenges, greater opportunity, autonomy is going on here, a chance to uh, achieve mastery by going after difficult stuff. There's no reason these things can't be baked into the game that's going to represent the job that people live in. And then there's stuff that, that can be added that just we know that it works. People like to collect things. They like to make choices under scarcity. That's what economics is. So people like to have those kind of opportunities to make choices. And how else are you going to decorate your avatar if you don't have to make choices about buying things and that sort of thing? OK, so reason number six. Uh, there's a mature understanding, we think, of the ingredients that you can use to actually create this engagement. This is just our list. They also happen to be some chapters in the book. Uh, uh, it's always good to compare this list and listening uh, 
presentations that you folks make. You might have your own, own list, but this is a toolbox, I think, for thinking about how each of these features can be matched against uh, difficult parts of work. So I, we've already talked about self-representation. As a psychologist, I think this is one of the most interesting comments about new media. It's not passive, I'm sitting there waiting for it to pass over me. It's not just interactive. Uh, there's contingency on the screen based on my input, but I actually act, get to be on the screen. And we know that from other, other studies that when you touch my shoulder in this, on the screen, in the virtual world, the same neurons that fire when you touch my shoulder in real life are mirrored uh, uh, in real life. So this is a very important kind of mini-me uh, ingredient that we can use to create a great sense of engagement and involvement. Uh, ranks and levels that are transparent, that you get to see, that indicate expertise. These are things that could be easily transferred into business. I've already mentioned stories. All of the action in these games happens in a story. That guides what you do, what your role is, how you uh, relate to people that you're collaborating with, but there's still a lot of opportunity for extemporaneous uh, uh, play. There's feedback, and most importantly, feedback in every time scale. Jennifer was getting information about how things were going moment by moment, as well as how things went today, how the quarter's going, the week, etc. So feedback, a lot of psychology, the, feed, uh, the psychology of feedback is in a time domain that really doesn't show up much in terms of uh, uh, company evaluations. It's in a time domain that's short, it's seconds and minutes and, and maybe a day, but it's certainly not quarterly reviews. Uh, there's, there are economies in these games. We've been extremely interested in this show. We'll show you an example in a second. Uh, synthetic currencies that work just like real money, but it's not real money. It's not taxed. The HR folks don't uh, get mad at you, at least uh, not, not yet. But you can get all the kinds of decision making uh, that happened under conditions of scarcity uh, with the virtual currency. And it could be Linden dollars, it could be uh, bananas, gold pieces, whatever. Teams, these are social activities. That's on our ingredient list. Communication, especially communication that's reconfigurable. I want to talk to all the priests over against the wall. I want to talk to all the uh, people at my level, or in my guild, all the guild officers, whatever it is. It's not necessarily new, new technology, but it certainly beats uh, having uh, chats going on in the background at work uh, while you're on a video conference, you know, saying we need to lose this conversation, it's not helping business. And all of this do is done with the clock running. And this is a huge part of the psychology of how this works. So all of these ingredients can, can name things in the toolkit that can be applied. So have you got the point that we're not talking about training? Uh, training is a wonderful thing. A, a billion dollars a year or more spent on corporate training and enterprise training for, for the military, if you include that, far, far more. Um, but we're actually talking about taking advantage of these ideas in line. These ideas are too good to save for while you're fixing to make money for shareholders. You should be using these ideas while you're making money for shareholders or whatever the mission of your enterprise is, if it's a nonprofit. So we really believe some people, especially when there are a lot of people doing the same thing, like Jennifer or video surveillance guards. We'll talk about Vinny in a minute. Uh, a lot of people doing pretty much the same thing. It's, it's worth the effort maybe to build a triple-A game for them that really rocks their world. On the other hand, as Peter alluded to in the introduction, maybe we can also pick and choose from this ingredient list and use the things that are appropriate to the job. I mean, what job wouldn't be better if people's reputations were more transparent, for example, our feedback weren't given in more often, more accurately, and more, more uh, in different time scales. Let me uh, tell you about Ross Smith. He's, he's a Seattle guy, or at least here in the environs. He works at a little company here called Microsoft, and he's, he is a very creative game designer at work. And one of his most recent projects was to help with the launch of Windows 7, a momentously important event in the life of that company. And can you imagine how many pages of documentation when they launched this in over 80 different languages simultaneously, how many pages of documentation had to be QC? So they were interested in tapping this vast, diverse Microsoft workforce who had all these different language skills. And Ross and his team devised a game in which people, uh, it was very easy for people to access screens that needed to be QC'd, to review them, and to earn points. So a total of 4,600 people played, a half a million screens were reviewed. Uh, typical player uh, might have done 100 screens 
Uh, one, one guy reviewed 9,300 uh, screens, and he won. But there were ranks and levels and leaderboards and some fun art. And you know, this, this is as good an example of uh, here locally that, uh, of, of our thesis that we're talking about. Now, this was above and beyond behavior. It was all voluntary behavior. We are going to see, little by little, these ideas creep from that above and beyond behavior to the mainline behavior. Here's another example. This is just about the barest elements of a game. Have you ever been, this is a POS, and it's not what you think that means. It means point of sale system. Point of sale system at Target. And most Target stores provide the checkers feedback on how fast they're checking against norms. It takes longer to check out an article of clothing you have to fold than it does a box of toothpaste. And so while your items are being scanned into the basket, they're getting these, these little things that say G, R, G, 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 R, G, G. I don't know why they didn't get the colors right, but G means green or good. It means you, you, you met the norms for the checkout speed. R means you were slower than the norms. Now, this could drive you crazy unless you happen to be a checker that believes, you know what's really important to our customers is that after they've made their purchase, they get out of the store quickly. So it's really important to our customers, and maybe it's important to me because it's important to my employer, because it's important to the customer, and maybe there is a big epic story here. It's not just a stupid little you know, thing to drive me to work faster for the same pay. Uh, so you know, I'm not sure how well they've gotten that done, but it's just the barest elements of a game. There's a little thing, a little total score, and so on. Anybody in this room could take this bare kernel of a, of a game and turn it into a fabulous game for checkers at Target. And we're, we're sure you're going to see that before 2020. So here's an example of going to the ingredient list and picking one ingredient out and putting it in the game and putting it in a place uh, in, in the workflow that is kind of on the way to work. It's, uh, it's where you're working. It's your, this is in, in this case, it's your Outlook uh, uh, email program. And it's the ingredient that we took, and this is actually a working product. Uh, the ingredient we took was the virtual uh, economy these current, a currency that we could create, make scarce, keep track of it really well, and ask people to make decisions about exta exchanging information using this currency. So in this example right here, I might want to send you a, uh, a piece of mail with a great idea. I've got a bank of currency, uh, and I say, you know, I've got 500 in my, in my bank here. This is so important, such a wonderful idea. I'm going to spend 200 units of th that currency. Uh, and, and attach it in a, a note to Leighton and say, let's get on this. And Leighton's going to send back uh, only 100 units of currency because he's my boss and he's trying to redirect the company toward a different goal, uh, so I'm not rewarded. Uh, or he might send back uh, 250 and say, boy, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard of. And you keep an exchange. You get this currency flowing uh, like oil in the system, loosening up people's decisions, but quantifying decisions. So we've actually experimented with this a bit. Uh, you can see up here on the right, it's actually a separate screen that I can order my inbox based on how much currency was attached uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the note. I could look down and keep track of the network of currency. I could see there was this one group over here in engineering that is really having a lot of high value note exchanges with the marketing department. Uh, that might be a pretty interesting thing to notice. But you can also put this in a game. You can also give badges and levels and recognize what's going on in using just the ingredients that, that, uh, that you're putting into these games. So I might uh, get a badge for being the person in my information network that uh, got more currency back than he sent out. Well, that's pretty cool. So there, people are really responding well to me. I get a, I get a badge. I might get a badge for lots of other uh, uh, communicating broadly in the company. Whatever is aligned with the corporate objective that that game could, could, could help with. Uh, so it's a game that we've been playing for a couple years, working software, it's, and, and it uh, uh, could be fun if we can get the right badges, if we can get the right ingredients going. Check it out on uh, Seriosity.com. It's called a tent. Reason number seven, the last of our seven reasons why we I think it's inevitable. I thought anyway, so we're going to do it. You thought, OK, fine. <laughs> reason <laughs> seven. Gamers already do work in the games. Peter talked about leadership, but we were interested in whether there were a lot of other kinds of work that are going on cryptically in these games that people outside your world hadn't noticed. So we did something really fun a few years ago. We hired some college students, 
And we sent, who were elite level gamers, we sent, Byron advertised uh, at his school for uh, you know, elite gamers and people sent us all their resumes. We had lots of people. And we hired a few students and they wrote, and first thing, mom, dad, you'll never guess. <laughs> I got a job based on my game resume. And that was fun. And so we said, but now you're gonna work. We sent them on a quest to study the world of work. Go find taxonomies of work that we can use to look at this convergence. So uh, what we found was uh, the most interesting was, was part of a giant government project where they catalog every kind of job there is and what are the skills and what do people want to do and this and that. But down in the purple box, or the occupational requirements, buried in there is a thing um, that, that was a, an inventory that was just per perfect for us. Basically, it was a set of skills that work across all kinds of industries. I mean, you can't find a company uh, or, a, or a worker where you can't describe their job as one or more of these things, getting information, monitoring processes, leadership, followership, analyzing, di you know, diagnosing, fixing, programming, selling, negotiating, ev you know, on and on. So it, we had this formal taxonomy. We sent our college students into their games. World of Warcraft was just launching. So um, it was Warcraft and EVE Online and, and uh, S uh, Star Wars Online and, um, and a few other games. Just go find examples of stuff like this in the game. And we kind of held it to sort of a strict metaphor. I mean, yes, if you're repairing a, a mechanical device in the game, that would count for mecha repairing a mechanical device in the real world. At least what's going on between your ears is the same. And uh, Byron's proven that. Um, here was the surprising finding. Absolutely every single kind of work that we found on these taxonomies was beautifully represented in the games. There were no missing cells. So, Wait a minute. People are playing, paying Blizzard about $15 a month to do work over here. Why does my game suck so much that I have to pay them $60,000 a year over here to do essentially the same kinds of things? Obviously, this, it has to do with the context in which the work is taking place. And so we've been talking about autonomy and mastery and a sense of purpose. There's something about the games that get it right. And there's something about many, many modern jobs that don't get it right. Now, we think this is so powerful and so convincing that we think things could also go wrong. So we want to talk a little bit, and, and this is also important in our conversations with these hundreds of corporations, is, is to show a little balance here. You can see we're a little bit of, a, of an evangelist uh, for this. But it, anything um, uh, this powerful questions. But first, let's, let's meet Vinny, just to illustrate this. Vinny is gliding into his sling-backed game chase. I, I'm sure all of you work at a, at a workstation like Vinny there. Uh, he can't believe that only three months ago, he used to sit in his Grand Central Station video surveillance office trying to keep track of a dozen screens with nothing more than a walkie-talkie and a phone to summon response. I mean, even before his first coffee break, his, break, his eyes have glazed over with that peculiar kind of boredom that comes from a task that's impossible to do because it's too easy. But here at Range Finders, work is just a little bit different. This is what his screen looks like now. It's one big screen packed with information, and it's a video game. In fact, most of the people are on a video walking for real in Grand Central Station, but some of these people aren't there at all. Some of them were injected into the scene to see if Vinny notices. Not the guy in green, that's what somebody's been tagged. But how about that guy with the briefcase over his shoulder looking at the train? Is he, or, or maybe it's the girl. If we can paint the yellow line on the football field for the down markers without getting it on the back of the football players, then we're just one and maybe two generations of processing speed away from being able to put very convincing commuters into these real life videos in real time. Hard to do today but we're just not that far away, in which people walking down this, tra this train ramp aren't there at all. But it's Vinny's job to catch them if they have the stigmata that would suggest that, that they might be bad guys. And the thing that's interesting now that we can synthesize this task is we can force Vinny to make choices on a time frame that is very, very engaging. And not only that, we can tune his behavior to the objective function of the task. It is, it's, it's extremely costly to let a, bad, a real bad guy get on a train, the potential for devastation. But there's also a cost to calling in the troops and putting feet on the street to go down and check out a bad guy 
who's not really that bad. And every now and then something goes wrong, like that guy that got killed in London that was being chased by the, uh, the, the subway police. So there's a cost. The costs are different. As you know, we can, we can tweak and tune the reinforcement structure to drive Vinny to the, the performance that we want by properly rewarding and incenting uh, his choices about, around false positives and false negatives. The tools are there to do that. You know that because you design these things every day. So as soon as we have the ability to do this injection in real time in this thing, we're going to change Vinny's world. And it's going to be so compelling, we're going to have to worry about things for Vinny because it's going to be that powerful. Powerful stuff is dangerous. My other life, Byron's got his day job. Mine is investing in startup companies, particularly biotechnology companies. And I like to invest in technologies that are dangerous. Not because they're dangerous, but the correlate of that. If it can't be used badly and cause harm, it's probably not powerful enough to do good. You know, think about, think, think, think like fire. Uh, we've, it, we've, it's dangerous, but we've, we've learned all these ways to handle it. This room is filled with all sorts of things for mitigating and, and, and protecting against that particular danger. Uh, what's more dangerous than words, right? So we have rules about that, too. So powerful stuff can be used for great good. It can also be dangerous. So if, we're, if, we're, if, if we believe this is really going to happen, we also have to think cautiously about how it might be a miss. There's a lot of mistakes that can be made, and we're cataloging those that are, are being made as we're trying this out. Uh, there are a lot of wonderful stories, not wonderful, but uh, 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 dangerous stories about uh, av avatar mistakes in the workplace. Uh, if you're a boy, can you be a girl avatar? Uh, social norms, what can you look like? Uh, can you have a stable of uh, three characters that you play at work? Uh, lots of uh, uh, interest in, in style sheet for business uh, for av avatars. Uh, Vinny, uh, uh, killed a lot of guys every day, every hour, uh, virtually. Uh, there's certainly concern about uh, that uh, creeping into his uh, real life behavior, and there's a whole uh, literature on that. Uh, there are things that happen to one's body when you get uh, like repetitive stress uh, syndrome, uh, when you can't stop playing, play too much, or uh, are otherwise too engaged. Uh, there are mistakes here that alter reputations. I mean, if you're uh, uh, playing a game that's part of your work, that's the representation you have for salary increases, and uh, there's a lot of privacy issues at work uh, with transparency, which is valuable, we think. Uh, there's also information, uh, exact information about your expertise, maybe financial information as well, because that would be uh, useful to know for some reasons, but uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, important to keep private in others. So when we talk to our, our friends in corporate America or other large enterprises about these ideas, we, we like to ask them, do you have a game strategy? And they say, huh? What, what would that be? But by the end of our talk, they're starting to get the idea. A game strategy would be an approach to exploring, evaluating, deploying these powerful new management ideas and collaboration tools from the world of games. And they get the point that the reason they should care is that employees are increasingly going to expect it. And because it works, and your competitors are going to do it, and they're going to get the, they're going to get the employees who find this an engaging, exciting place to work. So we're really glad that uh, Cynthia and Peter invited us or recommended we come on Monday and not uh, a couple hours before noon today. So we've had a lot of good uh, time to sit in the sessions and we're really interested, I was mostly interested in, most interested in the sessions where they were trying to predict uh, uh, all the revolutions and disruptions that were going to happen. And here's our quick summary. This is a, a today slide. Uh, we hear that uh, entertainment games need to be offer immediate experience. There can't be friction. If you've got to click 36 times, you're dead. They need to be social, if, if not uh, aggressively viral, at least take into con uh, consideration the opportunities for team play. Uh, they need to be connected, and a lot of folks think connected to the real world, aug uh, augmented reality, uh, different devices that uh, I heard discussed, we heard discussed about uh, holding up your camera to the real world and getting that information into the virtual world in the game. They need to be optimized using analytics in very large databases, quantitatively done uh, as well as it can be done uh, to make sure that over time and in small chunks, uh, things are, 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 decisions are being made that, that increase audiences. And the one thing that we heard the most 
is that games are now free. So if that's how you see the future of entertainment, let's take a look at uh, Byron and Layton's take on what the future of games in the workplace are going to be like, all right? First, they're going to be collaborative. That's the form of social behavior that, that companies are really interested in. You know, you can't command collaboration. You can only elicit it, you create the circumstances for it to happen. Well, that's what games are going to look like in the enterprise. And they have to be in the flow. So it, they don't have to be immediate gratification. But there's some, a very similar concept here. They have to be on the way to where you're going while you work. Not in your way, not out of the way, but in the flow of your business process. They have to be aligned. They have to be connected to the corporate's big story and the, corporate, the corporation's big objectives. That's what the work games are going to look like. And optimized, you're darn right. But they're going to be measured. And the analytics are going to be around measurable things that matter to the owners of the enterprise whether it's government or a nonprofit or shareholders. But finally, and perhaps most interesting, is they're going to be paid. We don't see a trend anytime soon where corporations want to get their stuff for free if it really makes a difference in productivity and engagement and alignment. So we forecast a big opportunity here. But um, as uh, several great futurists have said, Roy Amroy. Is, uh, has been credited for this law, is that with technology, we all tend to overestimate the impact in the short term, but that we also underestimate how powerful its impact is in the long term. So we think we're at the beginning of a journey here. We've been optimistic here for the last few years and been surprised at how slowly things have happened. This is a wonderful time for people to join us in helping people think about how to make work a lot more wonderful. Here's how you get in touch with us. We'd really like to hear your ideas. We'd love to have your help on this journey. Thanks a lot.